I've always been a big fan of Saab's, and I had a lot of friends who owned them and loved them. And then one day Saab was just gone. So I decided to do a video on the rise of Saab and the fall of Saab, and the fact that it started as an airplane. In 1980, Saab was selling nearly a million vehicles a year. 30 years later, they were bankrupt. The story of this iconic automobile from Sweden is a cautionary tale of a company that started with a shady past, but with the best of intentions, and rose to financial success and international notoriety. But it's also the story of what happens when you have bad luck and no vision for the hard times, and so you make a deal with the devil. What happened to Saab is truly a Saab story. Saab stands for Svenska Aeroplane Aktekbologet, which translates to Swedish Airplane Corporation, because the Saab company originally started by building airplanes. It was the late 1930s, and the Saab Group was an aerospace and defense company in Trollhattan, creating military aircraft for Sweden as the European continent around them began preparing for what would eventually become World War II. At the time, the Swedish Air Force was looking to beef up their military presence so that they could protect their country's neutrality should there ever be a need to defend their country. But in reality, Saab was also a way for Germany to get around the peace treaty they signed at the end of World War I, when Germany wasn't allowed to build military equipment anymore. The Swedish company, Svenska Aro, had been set up in 1921 to assemble German aircraft, since Germany couldn't. During the 1920s, both Svenska Aero and rival ASJA also assembled aircraft for their own country, as well as other countries like England, making the British de Havilland Tiger Moth. In the 1930s, with the threat of World War II hanging over Europe, the Swedish government charged both companies to produce a steady stream of military aircraft. As they couldn't rely on aircraft from other nations, especially as their partner up till now had been Germany, so both Svenska Aero and ASJA merged, and by 1939 was eventually called Saab Aeroplan. Fortunately, Sweden was spared many of the fates that fell over the rest of Europe during World War II, and so in 1945, when the war was over, and there was no more need for military aircraft to protect their country from the threat of invasion, Sweden's Saab AB company moved from airplanes to automobiles. After the war, the governments around the world had all the military aircraft they needed, so Saab needed to do something with their spare production capacity. Car production in war-torn Europe was almost non-existent, and the U.S. was concentrating on satisfying their local demand. Because the Swedish market was already filled with motorcycles, trucks, and large cars at the end of World War II, Saab decided that it would be best to come up with a small, affordable car. The car would be the Saab 92, also called Ur Saab, which means original Saab. It was designed by their staff of aircraft designers, which makes a lot of sense as the Ur Saab looked like an airplane with its wings cut off. But that sleek design produced 50% less drag than contemporary cars. To put that into perspective, that's the same drag coefficient as a Ferrari F40. And this was 1947 at the time, and it's even more impressive if you put into consideration that the 16 engineers behind the Ursaab had no prior experience in designing cars, only airplanes, and only two of them even had a driver's license. It had only a two-stroke 18-horsepower engine, but it put them in the car-making business. And in 1949, the Ursaab Saab 92 was released. Interestingly, the number nine was used in virtually every Saab automobile created. The entire body was stamped out of one piece of sheet metal and then cut to accommodate doors and windows. The engine was a two-cylinder, giving it a top speed of about 65 miles an hour. And all the early Saab 92s were painted in dark green. Saab had a surplus of green paint from wartime production of airplanes, and bottle green would become a trademark for Saab cars. The Saab 92 was a national hero in Sweden a widely popular car from 1950 to 1955, even appearing on a Swedish postage stamp. But by 1955, the Saab 92, like many cars over the years, was ready for an upgrade. So what came next? The Saab 93.
The Saab 93 engine gained a cylinder, going from two to three, and its front fascia became the first to have Saab's trademark trapezoidal radiator grille. This grille went on to be a trademark in all Saab vehicles, and two new colors, gray-green and beige, were now available. The Saab 93 was the first car they exported, with the U.S. being the main market. They used their advertising to highlight their aircraft routes, something that Saab would point to again and again over their years. They started small, exporting just 300 vehicles in 1956. With limited spare parts on hand, Saab initially restricted sales to only a few areas in America, such as the Pacific Northwest, as many there in America at the time were Scandinavian loggers who had settled there. But by the end of the 1950s, all of the U.S. was their main export market. And with sales taking off in the U.S., and Saab being seen for rallying success, just a year after the Saab 93, the Saab 94, often referred to as the Sonnet 1, made its entrance as a sports coupe. Leaning on their aircraft division, the Sonnet used a lightweight aluminum frame, allowing its tiny 748cc engine to get to 99 miles an hour. It was a two-seat open-top lightweight roadster, which, 10 years later, would evolve into the commercially distributed Sonnet Models 2, V4, and 3. And with each year, and with each model, Saab had improved not only their engines, but their reputation as solidly built, reliable vehicles. The brand Saab was becoming synonymous with quality, and the hits kept coming. In 1959 came the Saab 95, an estate car that seemingly combined versatility with the thrill of driving. Housing the iconic two-stroke engine under its hood, the Saab 95 boasted a spacious cargo area, catering to both practicality and performance needs. The Saab 95 was a seven-seater two-door station wagon. It had a four-speed manual transmission, and there was a small handle on the firewall that, when pushed, put the car in a freewheeling mode. This allowed the driver to coast downhill, but when the power was needed, the transmission would re-engage and the driver could power the car uphill again. The following year, 1960, also continued the trend of a new model and a new model number, the Saab 96. Its innovative design, inspired by the contours of aircraft and its unconventional teardrop shape, instantly captured people's attention. But like all good stories, there were challenges the two-stroke engine needed special fuel and oil, and as a result, it produced more pollution. Still, these quirks just added to its charm. The Saab 96 wasn't just a regular car. It was a symbol of being different and standing out. It betrayed individuality and charisma. This powerhouse of a car quickly became a fan favorite in motorsports, and cementing Saab's reputation as a force to be reckoned with on the track. The Saab 96 had a more powerful engine, 42 horsepower new rear seats, bigger boot, new wraparound rear window, new instrument layout with safety padding. All new features making the Saab 96 stronger, roomier, and more beautiful. But Saab had just spent a lot of money expanding. It was still a small company with just one vehicle and didn't have money to develop a new engine or a variety of types of models. Buying a company from the outside would cut into Saab's tight profit margin, and the Saab CEO didn't want to take a risk. So Saab engineers staged a coup by going around the CEO at Saab to their biggest shareholder to plead their case. The result was that Saab tried another sports car with the Sonnet 2 in 1966. They called it, you guessed it, the Saab 97. To save weight, it had a fiberglass body. But the tiny 850cc two-stroke engine got the car from 0 to 60 in 12 and a half seconds and managed a top speed of 109 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats. However, Saab wasn't done conquering the era of the 60s. They had yet another surprise in their pockets. In 1968 came the Saab 99. It was a true marvel of engineering and it would lead them to be a powerhouse in the next generation. In 1969, following their success through the 1950s and 60s, Saab AB wanted to merge with Scania Vebus. The new company was known as Saab Scania AB. Under this new banner, Saab produced the Saab 99. Under the hood, you could choose from different engines, 
Some were faster, some were more fuel efficient. There were two-stroke engines or four-stroke counterparts. It had a new idea to keep the headlights clean when it rained. Inside, there was a lot of space to stretch your legs, and the seats were really comfy. This car was like a cozy haven for driving. The vehicle performed well in sales, and by 1976, Saab manufactured their one millionth vehicle. And if this base model wasn't already enough, in 1977, they introduced the Saab 99 Turbo, churning out 145 horsepower. It's worth mentioning here that the Saab 99 Turbo was ahead of its time in terms of safety. With energy absorbing bumpers and a reinforced safety cage, it was like driving your own personal fortress of protection. In 1978, Saab partnered with Fiat to remanufacture their Lancia Delta as the Saab 600. But the big vehicle of 1978 was Saab's first luxury vehicle, the now iconic Saab 900. The Saab 900 introduced advanced safety features, including a reinforced safety cage, crumple zones, and energy absorbing bumpers. It had a night panel that dimmed the dashboard lights at night so that you could see better out the windshield. Plus, it had a turbocharger, which made the car go faster when you press the gas pedal. Inside, the Saab 900 was comfy with seats that felt like cozy chairs, and the ignition key was placed down near the gear shaft, which was different from most cars. Saab was really into safety, so they made sure they had strong steel beams on the doors to protect in case of an accident. The Saab 900 went on to produce nearly 1 million units, and even today it has a large fan base. However, it wouldn't be wrong to say that the Saab 900 was probably the last car of the company's prime. In 1984, Saab introduced the Saab 9000, a car that blended performance, luxury, and engineering prowess. And it emerged as a shining light of hope during a time of change and challenges. Based on the Saab 600 and introduced in 1985, it was a huge leap ahead from its previous ones. The engines were bigger and more fuel efficient. The interior of the car itself was more spacious and comfortable. And of course, there was passenger safety with better airbags. But financially, Saab was in dire straits with rising costs and shrinking profits, and it needed a restructure and a partner. The car division broke away from the rest of Saab Scania and became its own company, Saab Automobile AB. And this new version of the company had a 50-50 split in ownership between longtime investor AB and General Motors. GM had been trying to produce high margin luxury models in Europe for decades and realized they needed a company like Saab to compete. For Saab's part, they saw GM's vast US dealer network hoping to expand its main export market. So at the time, getting GM to take 50% ownership was seen as win-win. Saab now had deep pockets in a partner that believed in the longevity of the brand, and GM had such high hopes in the company that they invested $600 million with an option to acquire the remaining 50% within a decade. But Saab and General Motors didn't mix. GM was like your straight-laced conservative uncle, and Saab was like the unruly teenager that was just going to rebel. Now together, in 1994, the two did redevelop the Saab 900. In 1997, Saab marked their 50th anniversary as a car maker. The company used their convention to launch a replacement for the aging 9000, the Saab 95. The 900 received a facelift and would now be called the Saab 93. This would be GM's first big push into the luxury car market. And while it would be the first car to offer ventilated seats, this is where things started to go south. As the 90s progressed, Saab's partnership with General Motors faced its share of challenges. GM introduced the dynamic of platform sharing, a common practice in the automobile industry. This meant that their two iconic models, the Saab 900 and 9000, now shared platforms with other GM vehicles. While this facilitated economics of scale and resource sharing, it led to concerns about diluting the uniqueness of Saab. 
and this move towards standardizing platforms had the potential to erode the brand's distinctive character. Add to that that the look and style of Saab cars were changing because, well, GM influenced them, and they didn't look as cool and unique as before. And this made fans sad and worried that maybe Saab wasn't going to be true to itself anymore. Also, some Saab models had issues with their quality control, which means they weren't as well made as they used to be known for. People think that GM trying to save money might have made these quality problems worse. And this hurt Saab's reputation even more. And unfortunately, this wasn't the end of their troubles either. The marketing and branding strategies of Saab under GM's ownership underwent alterations that were sometimes at odds with the brand's heritage. The messages and positioning that once resonated with Saab's loyal customer base became muddled, leaving potential buyers perplexed about the brand's identity and direction. Saab faced difficulties in connecting with its traditional audience and attracting new customers. And financial challenges loomed large as well. The late 90s saw a decline in Saab's financial health, partly due to the increased competition and changing market dynamics. And the partnership with GM, while offering resources, also constrained Saab's autonomy in addressing these challenges. The partnership with GM eventually resulted in internal rivalries. And in the midst of these issues, Saab underwent leadership changes within both the Saab and GM organizations. And as Saab entered the 2000s, the challenges intensified. Economic downturns, changing consumer preferences, and increased competition all put immense pressure on the brand. Saab relaunched their best-selling models with newer versions in an attempt to keep the brand alive. These included the Saab 900 Convertible and Saab 9000 Aero. The convertible was somehow successful in establishing a niche for itself. It became a symbol of individuality. On the other hand, the era was positioned for sportiness and advanced driving dynamics. Despite efforts to introduce new models and maintain its legacy of innovation, it still wasn't enough, and the once mighty Saab was clearly struggling. In 2000, GM made a bold move and bought the remaining 50% shares as well gaining the complete ownership of Saab. During this period, Saab's legacy of innovative engineering was prominently displayed in the Saab 9.3 and the Saab 9.5 models. Saab enthusiasts who had a deep affinity for the brand's character and driving dynamics loved the fact that the Saab 9.3 and 9.5 continued to embody the spirit of innovation. But sadly, even these two phenomenal models couldn't help Saab get a firm foothold in the competitive market which was now dominated by other European automakers. Then things got even worse, as in 2008, General Motors faced its own financial crisis and filed for bankruptcy, and Saab's future became increasingly uncertain. With a government bailout, GM was forced to make difficult decisions and cut several brands, including Hummer, Saturn, Pontiac, and yes, Saab. The attempt to sell Saab proved to be a complex and challenging process. Various buyers emerged, but finding a suitable owner that could ensure Saab's future proved elusive. They needed a Hail Mary, and they got one from the Dutch. In 2010, Dutch sports car manufacturer Spiker Cars managed to acquire Saab from General Motors, aiming to inject new life into the brand However, the new ownership couldn't reverse Saab's downward trajectory. Despite their efforts to secure financing and develop new models, Saab continued to struggle financially. It was as if the universe had decided that Saab's time was up, and no one could save it from drowning. The years that followed were marked by a series of setbacks. Production disruptions, supply chain issues, and declining sales took a toll on Saab's reputation and financial stability. Regrettably, Saab was faced once again with a dire situation. The company filed for bankruptcy in December 2011, which marked the end of Saab's operations as an independent car manufacturer. Production ceased, and the future of the Saab brand hung in the balance yet again. Several companies expressed interest in acquiring Saab, including Chinese automaker Youngman and the Chinese city of Qingdao. However, regulatory and financial obstacles prevented these deals from materializing. 
Additionally, GM, which still held certain technologies and licenses related to the Saab products, expressed concerns about transferring these assets to potential buyers. Ultimately, the efforts to save Saab proved unsuccessful and the company's assets were gradually liquidated. The Saab name, logo, and remaining assets were sold to National Electric Vehicle Sweden AB, NEVS, a company focused on electric vehicles and mobility solutions. NEVS intended to develop electric vehicles under the Saab brand, but these plans were never pursued. Even though NEVS used Saab's know-how to make electric cars, they decided not to call these cars Saab. It marked the end of an era defined by combustion engine vehicles, turbocharged performance, and distinctive Scandinavian character. And finally, the story of the legendary Saab came to a not-so-happy end. And Saab is not the only car that was gobbled up by GM. The Hummer's origin story is one right out of a Hollywood action film. Literally, as actor Arnold Schwarzenegger is credited with turning the military Humvee into a street-legal vehicle. And you can watch that story right here, right now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you saw, I hope you'll give a subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.